Hanging with Higgins, where author and former prosecutor John J. Higgins interviews his intriguing guests about their lives, knowledge, experiences, and projects. Explore, learn, and be entertained. Come join us now. Good evening and welcome to Hanging with Higgins. I'm your host, John J. Higgins. Tonight, I have an interesting author and fellow New Jerseyan, John Hazen, as my guest. John has written four novels, three of which are already published, Dear Dad, Fava, and Journey of an American Son. John also worked for the New Jersey State Government, and although we never met, while I served my time, we probably know many of the same people. So welcome, John. How are you today? Oh, thank, thank you, John, for having me on. I'm doing very well, and I appreciate uh, being on with us this, this evening. Well, it's my pleasure. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I was uh, born and raised in uh, Massachusetts, a small, small town, you know, the, uh, out in the west central part of the state, a great place to, to grow up. But, uh, you know, uh, it's one of those great places to be from, I'd say. <laughs> you know, not, uh-huh. not a lot happening and wanted to get away. So I came down to uh, to Rutgers to go to school and uh and have stayed in this in this area ever since. Uh, you know, we live in New Jersey now, but uh, lived for four years in uh, uh, in New York, in uh, the Bronx, and uh, in Brooklyn. And okay. uh, yes, and uh, we, uh, you know, uh, and I've been working for the uh, Department of Environmental Protection for uh, you know past almost thirty years. Uh, before that, I worked for a small local development. Development Corporation in uh, the South Bronx doing commercial revitalization projects and housing rehabilitation and things like that. Uh, uh-huh. And, uh, you know, um, in terms of writing, I've just kind of, it's something I always wanted to do and uh, uh, just kind of never got around to doing it. And then one day just kind of brought the laptop on the train to work with me and you know, here I am four novels later. <laughs> Started at it. Yeah. So, so I'm always interested in, in how somebody, uh, you know, what, what's in their background that gets them to where they are. So what did you enjoy doing when you were growing up? I assume Massachusetts, where you were, were like small village kind of environments, or was it more like the Boston no, no, uh, no. metropolitan area? Oh, sheltered village, you know, a small town. Uh, funny story is that I remember in, in – uh, I was in grad school, had some time to come to the library, and I looked my town up in the census. It was the 1970 census and 1980 census, and the uh, 1970 census said that it had 2,014 people, and 1980 census was 2,013. So I said, well, that, during that time I left, so uh, I, I so was you the one person that lost. So, yeah, yeah. And, you know, grew up, uh, um, you know, my both my parents uh, you know, worked in factories. My my mother was college educated. She went to to Tufts, uh, and uh, uh, my my father was you know more of a he was a, a printer in a um, in a, a ribbon factory. Uh, but you know, kind of despite the uh, kind of working class upbringing, it was always just assumed that I was going to go to go to college, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, and my uh, my sister she preceded me down to down to Rutgers and uh, and then my uh, younger brother went to Worcester Polytech. Uh, and I have another brother who became a truck driver. Um, he's uh-huh. probably, probably, if truth be known, he's probably the brightest of the, the four of us. But he chose to go that way. Um, you know, so growing you know growing up, I you know I love sports. Uh, you know, big Red Sox fan. Uh, hope you don't hold that against me. Um, of course not. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, did uh, uh, you know lot, lots of sports activities. And but I, was, you know, like I said, it was assumed I'd go to college, so you know, kind of learning was always you know uh, preeminent in our house. And uh, I've just been, uh, you know, I noticed that you have a, a thing for history, which I share with you. It's just always been. Uh, you know, something that, that I've just, just loved. And, you know, I try to incorporate that into my uh, writings as much as possible. Uh, uh-huh. History aspect of things. 
Well, I usually say to people that don't like history, it's it, what you really need to do is understand that these are really people's stories. It's not about really dates and you know events. It's how people handled themselves during these crazy times that they lived in. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, many teachers don't really have the ability to transmit that to their students. Yeah, it just kind of just becomes a dry chronology. But uh, you know, uh, you know, like a couple of my favorite uh, you know, nonfiction writers are uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin and uh, David McCullough, and they just have a way of of making history kind of come alive, and you get to you get a feel of the people. And, uh, and, times and kind of what they're going through, what shaped their their lives and their decision making. Um, so, right. you know, I just saw a friend of mine were talking about that Sons of Liberty series that was just on the History Channel, mm-hmm. and as I was sitting and watching it with with my girlfriend, she would be asking me questions, and I'd be going. I don't know. This doesn't look right. <laughs> I, I don't think this is the way that happened. Yeah. <laughs> and and then the David McCullough series that they did, the John Adams one, I thought was fabulous. Yes, yes. But that was on HBO. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it was. A, it really gave you, you know, I thought it especially gave you a feeling of the, the grittiness of the time, and uh, you know, like God watching uh, Abigail go through. Kind of the smallpox and uh, you know how uh-huh. the, 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 the crude you know, vaccinations back then. I just said, boy, you know, that just kind of really came through to me that it was a uh, um, a real depiction of you know how they handled their problems back then. So, like I said, right. that's the type of thing I like to you know, work into my into my writing and in, in a lot of uh, uh, you know in, in each of my books uh, they have a historical component that I you know really love uh, bringing in. Well, now, when you went to Rutgers, because you and I weren't too far apart when we were at Rutgers, um, I was in Rutgers College, so I could not take, because my major was psych, but I could not take my minor in history because it was still considered humanity, so I had to take it in English as opposed to history, which always was a little funny to me. Uh, Did you have that same restriction when you were there? I don't really recall that. I mean, I, I didn't didn't have a minor. I just had the, the major in psych, and you know, at the time it was kind of a, you know, what what do I want to do in my life? Well, let's get a psych degree, and <laughs> uh, uh-huh. you know, so uh, it was. Uh, but I did, you know, I was able to take courses all over. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, one of my favorite professors was a, a, a Cook English professor, which is you know, kind of an odd beast. Uh, uh, uh-huh. Barbara Goff, and uh, you know, I took a an English course with her that I just thought was was fascinating. You know, like I said about Doris Kearns Good when she kind of made uh, you know actually made Chaucer come alive for me, you know, <laughs> which uh, you know uh, it's, it's not an easy task. No, it isn't. No, so yeah, uh, um, yeah. So I you know I did take courses all over, um, and uh, you know, uh, you know, I went. Uh, you know, I had uh, Douglas courses, and I had, uh, you know, I got my degree from Rutgers College, and you know, uh, great, great experience. But uh, you know, like I said, you know, psychology, you know, you know uh, was a was a degree at the time that I that I took, but not quite knowing what to do, so I just kind of, um, you know, ended up in the environmental field. So you, you know, go figure. <laughs> right. Well, I think back in the days that we were going to college, too, the idea was you got some kind of liberal arts degree, and then, you know, there were a lot of opportunities to do various things. It really wasn't um, – I think it's gotten more narrowed as time has gone gone on. I think you're right. And Everything is so specialized and, you know, kind of, you know, you take these courses. And, yeah, and I, and I think overall it's helped my writing by having this type of background just because it's, it's been so – so diverse. Um, you know, another one of my favorite courses that I, you know, clearly remember taking was a course on the Old, Old Testament in the, at Rutgers College, and uh-huh. some, you know, some of the lessons from that I, you know, kind of still still keep with me. That, uh, um, you know, so I think people miss out if they don't 
kind of have a, a broad education, a broad uh, exposure to, uh, you know, to various fields and, you know, various disciplines. Well, I've always said to people that were interested in, in Rutgers, I said, the wonderful thing about Rutgers is that you really are attending five colleges at the same time mm -hmm. because you could take courses from Douglas to Cook to Livingston to, to Rutgers or um, – there was an, I guess you could even take some of the coursework in, you know, some of the science departments in engineering or pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that you weren't trapped. Part of my problem with the Rutgers College psych approach was it was all experimental, but I was really interested in more of like the theorists, like the Freudians and the whatever. And Livingston had many of those courses, so I took a, a bunch of psych courses over at Livingston. Of course, I still had to teach rats how to bar press to get the degree out of Rutgers College, yeah. but uh, you know that was a little bit of silliness to me. Um, but you know, it was it was really a great experience and. Uh, I was also a preceptor up at, uh, on Bush campus, and I basically had the engineering, uh, pharmacy, and pre-med students in my buildings. And in some ways, it was really sad because they may be lucky to get an elective a semester or, or an elective a year. And, you know, yeah, I remember, at 18, 19 years old, how do you know what you really want to do? Right. Yeah, I remember I remember in my dorm since some of the folks were in the engineering programs and they were just so focused on uh, uh, on that you know, particular body of work that there wasn't really a lot of exposure to, to other things. I guess I'm yeah. better engineers, but uh, yeah. Well, I had one boy actually who he really didn't want to go into engineering. He wanted to go into music. And you know the one the one day he kind of complained to me, and I said, "Well, why don't you take some music courses then?" He goes, "Well, my dad would never let me." I said, "Well, you need to tell your dad to go back to college." And you know, I mean, it's your life, not not your dad's life. Right. And you know, so so it was just interesting. And like I say, I thought it was a good experience because it gave me me also kind of a broad, you know. Uh, background mm -hmm. in, in various things because I love to learn and I particularly love to learn things I really don't know much about so that was you know an interesting thing right. so now you went on to, to grad school and and you went to I guess cook it was for environmental science well I, I mean I I came by a kind of roundabout uh, actually I worked uh, one year to in the environmental science department, uh, and the chairman of the th at that time was my, uh, who would become my future father-in-law, uh, okay. Joel, Joel Kaplowski. So, you know, he needed help in kind of taking samples around the state. So, uh, that's really kind of how I ended up getting my job is, uh, you know, like I said, I was working for a nonprofit in the South Bronx, um, a small nonprofit. We, we did a lot of good stuff. We set up a, recycling center we had some housing advocacy programs we you know help businesses to install security systems things like that but you know after six years of that and at the end i was kind of handling the books and doing uh um you know kind of doing the every two weeks saying okay do we have enough money scraped together to meet payroll you know after a while that gets gets a little wearing on you so i started looking in the new york times and uh at the time that DEP was was growing like gangbusters, especially in the uh, site remediation, you know, hazardous site uh, uh, remediation program. So I saw that they were hiring. I called my father and I was like, uh, you know who this, you know who this is? And he said, yeah, I can. You know. It was one of his former students. So I called him and you know he hired me and, and I uh, you know started with them back in. Uh, 1985, and uh, been there ever since, and uh, kind of drifted into the uh, legislative affairs program. Uh, you know, in the early 90s, uh, I was joking when someone says, "Well, you know, it's only a temporary thing." I said, "Well, I was, it was 1991. I went up to work in uh, legislative affairs on a temporary assignment, and here it is, 2015, and I'm still there." But uh, but it's actually it's a very good fit because uh, you know, kind of. I really love, uh, you know, kind of seeing what the laws do and how they, uh, um, you know, how they work and how they can be improved and, you know, work, you know, I love like being a liaison between the department and the state house and, you know, legislators and uh, the other departments and 
um, I've always been kind of a generalist at heart. So this way I can kind of go from, you know, one, you know, one day I'm working on, uh, you know, uh, fishing licenses and then the next day it's on uh you know air pollution control and the next day is in uh you know uh green acres land acquisition so it's always a lot of variety and you know uh and uh you know i've always found the legislative offices to be you know you know people complain about legislators but i've always found that you know they want to do the right thing they're, they're trying to and you know um and it's you know it's just been a, it's been a rewarding career for me. So. Right. Well, that is a tough job, you know, uh, particularly from being a legislator, a legislator, because you're voting on all kinds of different topics. So you know you do need to have a good staff around you or you know good contacts so that you can get a sense of you know what it is. And you know before I finished college, I worked in and out of industry, and I worked for some. You know, the one place I worked for was in the water supply in Rocky Hill. They were such a, a good corporate uh, neighbor. And um, so I saw in many ways how these companies would operate if there weren't, you know, you really had to quadrant them in and control what they were doing. Because, you know, profit gets in the way of, uh, uh, you know, being a good neighbor sometimes. And, and many of these companies too, because I guess when that was in the, Basically, in the mid '70s, you know, some of those companies weren't always in great financial shape either. So, you know, they were they were like eking out an existence. So, doing all the environmental things that they should be doing, they were always trying to cut corners. So, I think it's one of the good things that New Jersey was able to do over those years is that you know I think we have a much better uh, handle on what to do with industry when it comes to environmental problems. Oh yeah, no, de- definitely, and, you know. And- I've always, you know, my dealings with industry too is, has been, you know, one thing they constantly look for is certainty. You know, if you don't, if, you know, they, they'll, they'll, te- they'll take a no answer. They'll, they'll try and, you know, argue against a no answer. But if it's a no up front and they can deal with it and they can plan for it, then, uh, you know, then they're, they're fine. Um, right, and, right. So, yeah. Yeah, so. And I, you know, I was I was over at the legislature too. We were trying to shepherd through the governor's council on alcoholism and drug abuse, and that was that was a nightmare in itself because the drug and alcohol people couldn't get along with one another. They yeah. they were always fighting over the money, and you know, I was with Carrie because you, know, you you and I both know who Carrie Edwards was, and I was with him the one meet at the one meeting with the 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 one alcohol guy who kept, kept becoming a problem. And he said, look, if you stop fighting us, we can go back to the governor. We can get you, you know, another $800 million or some extraordinary amount of money. He goes, but you got to stop fighting. And sure as hell, the next time it's in front of the legislature, continued the fight. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's sometimes they, they can't let go of their own position to afraid that somebody else is going to get something. Mm-hmm. And so by the time I was done getting that through, I was done with the drug and alcohol field. <laughs> I didn't want to be around any of them anymore. So then I moved on to other things. Right. So um, wh- when did you start thinking about writing? Because I know that doesn't come out of nowhere. I had always wanted to. It's just kind of one of those things, you know, wanting to and then just never getting around to doing it and you know kind of these ideas just kind of pop into my mind but never really having the either the time or the energy to sit down and you know and then just one day I just started bringing my laptop on the uh, train to work with me and said well let me just start doing it. let me just start to uh, you know see if I can put together and just kind of take one of these ideas and, and work it in and uh, you know so it's it's you know a very rewarding process for me. I, you know I just I just love it. Um, you know and uh, but I'm you know I'm I'm kind, of, I'm kind of the type of person that you know I'm uh, can't say I'm real focused in my uh, you know in my approach or you know real disciplined. I'm uh, you know I'm definitely what you would call a uh, you know fly by the pants. I, I have a general theme in each of my books and general kind of overall overarching message I want to get across. But, you know, I do 
love to make it up as I go along. I can't really sit down and kind of outline it. And, uh, you know, so the, you know, the process for me is, it's, it's very rewarding because, uh, you know, I love to tell people that, uh, you know, I love it when I introduce a minor character in my book and, you know, you know, it's just introduced for the purpose of the plot at the moment, you know, it might be an obstacle for the protagonist or whatever, but then as time goes on, you know, this person kind of grows right in front of my eyes and ends up being a major character in the book. And it's, you know, I just, you get such a thrill out of that because I guess kind of see this, you know, for person from where in my mind he was, he was just a you know, kind of a plot device to really being, you know, uh, a major thing. And I can, you know, I can think of in each of my books, you know, characters who were that way. Uh, so, uh-huh. you know, it's, it's, it, you know, that's kind of the process I go through. I don't know if, you know, you know, as a result, I do kind of have, you know, major writer block because it's not as if I can say, okay, I'm going to write down, I'm going to sit down and write this. You know, sometimes I get to a point and say, uh oh, where's the plot going now? I've gotten it to this point and now I've got to get it to, <laughs> right, right. to where I want to be. And, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be, uh, yeah, and I, you know, I do remember, you know, one of my books, I was, I did have like a 2 a.m. aha moment where, you know, I was kind of lying there. Then it just kind of came to me. I'll do this, I'll do this, and I'll do this, and then, <laughs> you know, right. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, uh, that's kind of, kind of how I do it, and, you know. Um, well, I do think it's a fascinating process in that, you know, for me, it's almost meditative when I do it, mm-hmm. um, because I, I, you know, I just go into the zone, and the focus can become so great that, Absolutely lose track of time or anything going on around me. Yeah, I've, I've, I've missed I've missed my train stop. <laughs> <laughs> so first, all of a sudden, I look up and I'm uh, you know two, two stops beyond where I should be getting off. So I have to call my wife. I said, "Oh, can you can you go up to Raleigh and pick me up?" And <laughs> it's an oops. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, and, and and I think you know, for me, because I wrote about angels in heaven, and it has nothing to do with anything I've ever done before, uh-huh. but. As as I struggled with it, it's because I had to go through a lot of self examination about what my perspective was on, you know, different things about you know God and how angels would operate and what they would do. Because historically, they really aren't. There's really not any real definitive thing on them. And it, I got to a point that I was going, oh boy, this isn't working. So that that's when I jumped back and I basically outlined just the place. So that I could get a sense of it and the name, so that I, they wouldn't be floating all around for me. And once I did that, it was like the whole thing fell into place because I was hearing the voices of the characters in those positions. Mm-hmm. And and I don't mean that I don't think I went schizophrenic, but it was like I could I could I could tell what that character would do in that circumstance, mm-hmm. and and then it begins to write itself. Right. Right. Yeah, by the same token, I'm sure with angels, there's, there's so much in the literature, like all over the place, I'm sure you had to get familiar with, and, you know, mm-hmm. did you want to, to kind of have, uh, have, have the choir, to they, had, they had such a weird, it's just a weird setup that comes from, uh, with the pseudo Dionysus in the 400s or whatever, you know, with the three choirs, mm-hmm. with three groups within, and whatever, so I had to come to some kind of... Uh, I had to make choices and say, okay, this is the way I'm going to view it, and this is the way I'm going to do it. Yeah. Because if you tried to, if you tried to uh, get all of those those different writings into agreement with one another, it would never work. Right. Yeah. And you'd be all over the place, and you know, the hard thing right. that wouldn't uh, result in a novel. Right. And I didn't want to write a history either because it's, that stuff becomes so dry right. that, and I don't know, it's just not creative enough for me. Mm-hmm. And I, I really enjoyed the the path. I've got another bunch of novels I've been starting that aren't angels, but it was like the angels were in my way. Yeah. Every place I looked, I saw something about it that would fit into what I was going to do and whatever, and it was like, all right, so i got to get that out of my hair first. Right, right. And I'm still not done. I'm about halfway through in the – I've got like a nine-book series, but you know, I've got it far enough along that I can break off and do some other things. And then, and then I'll go back and I'll finish because I have it. I have it pretty much figured out in my head where it goes. I can't tell you all the all the details within each novel, but I can tell you where each one ends. Mm-hmm. So 
you know. And as long as I have an endpoint, then I know what I'm writing to. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So, so now, um, why don't you talk about – now, was Dear Dad your first novel? Uh, first, the first published one, yeah. I mean, my first one actually – the first one I sat down to start writing um, is the one I haven't published yet. It's, it's, it's still just kind of floating out there, and I'm actually working on a bit of a rework with it. Uh, you know, uh, the one, one person who's uh, read all of my novels said, you know, Oh, he really, he really liked, you know, the first one. He said, but the second one was just so much more mature in your writing, you know. So now, you know, um, you know, the second one, uh, you know, uh, Dear Dad, um, was uh, it's actually, you know, I kind of used my small town New England as you know as a setting, um, but what it is is I took a, I wanted to have something that kind of compared war in different contexts and different settings. And I took two wars, the Vietnam War and the Civil War, that had such okay. drastically different public levels of support. And, you know, and you mentioned those two wars to, to people and they, they instantly get image of, you know, uh, Images in their mind and they're, you know, diametric, diametrically opposed. It's like, well, how about if I do a book that kind of draws both of them together? So it's got a bit of a fantasy component where a Vietnam soldier is critically wounded. And then when he wakes up, he finds himself in a uh, um, Union Army hospital in 18, 1862 Tennessee under Grant. Okay. okay. And the thing is, he knows, he knows that he doesn't belong there. He knows that he belongs in the 1960s, but he's kind of stuck in this place. And, you know, and he had a lot of the kind of, you know, typical Vietnam experiences and was, you know, uh, you know, despondent. And by being in the civil war, he kind of finds redemption and finds that, you know, he can have a, have a purpose and, uh, you know, and, and can be part of something bigger than himself. So, you know, and, uh, and that was, some, you know, uh, one that it was just kind of an idea that was floating around in my mind that, uh, um, you know, kind of comparing the two wars and, uh, you know, uh, so I just kind of started writing and, uh, you know, I was able to get the Vietnam portion down and then kind of went through the writer's block of, so how do I get it to the Civil War? And, uh, you know, so that that came along. So, uh, yeah, and that one, you know, that one, you know, I tried, you know, tried reaching out to, you know, doing the, the whole uh, agent and publisher route and wasn't finding anything. So I said, well, let me try and let me self-publish it. You know, I went through a create space with Amazon and actually, you know, it cost, but I had a good experience with them. I thought it was very, uh, you know, they were helpful. They were helpful. Interesting process because, uh, you know, so I wanted to compare these two wars, Vietnam and, and the civil war. Um, but I found out that I didn't really know a lot about the Vietnam war, even though I grew up through, you know, in that era. Um, there was just so much that I didn't know. So that, that took a, a lot of research. Whereas the Civil War, I'd kind of been pretty well read. And, you know, I was always been a, I was like, Grant was a, a fascinating character, you know, that uh, rose to the occasion at the time. And, and you know, the Battle of Shiloh was, you know, was one that I just thought was, you know, you know kind of a fascinating, you know, <laughs> two-day war. And you could, you know, uh, uh, one of the, it was the one that kind of convinced America that, Hey, this was going to be a long, bloody war. It was you know up to then? It was, they still, everyone still had hopes that uh, they'd be home by you know, you know, by Christmas type thing. And that one, that was the one that uh, kind of convinced America that no, this is going to take some time and and uh, a lot of bloodshed. So you know that. So I wanted to kind of incorporate those into into the book, and uh, you know, um, and it was uh, you know a lot, a lot of fun, and I think it. You know, and got that one self self published through uh, uh, Create Space. Um, you know, after kind of going the route of not really getting a takers publisher or agent wise, and I said, no, let me. Yeah, I want to get this out there, so I so I published it, and um, you know, limited uh, expense, but you know, and limited uh, 
exposure, but uh, I'm actually trying to recirculate it so that you know, people are aware of it, and you know, hopefully they'll, they'll find it as interesting as I as I did, you know, uh-huh. in, in, in writing. It sounds it sounds very much like an old Twilight Zone episode. Uh, yeah, I can I could see that. It's it's got it's kind of got that flavor. Because um, you would wake up and then you'd be in a whole different place. Of, of course, though, it seems that your the experience of your protagonist would be much more pleasant than usually what happened to the Twilight Zone protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and kind of you know, at the, at, and I tried to present it so that you know he kind of wanted to get back to his own world and. Uh, um, you know, and the, the the title of the book is uh, you know actually you know tried to make it so that uh, you know his father was actually a, a hero in uh, World War Two. You know, he you know okay. he got a medal in the Battle of the Bulge, but then by the same token, he was against the Vietnam War because he didn't know what we were fighting for. So I tried to you know kind of get some complexity. So you know the, the title you know he wants to get back you know, to his father, to, you know, to his world. But at the same time, he's kind of growing and developing while he's in, you know, this alternate world and, uh, you know, dealing with the people and uh, at that time. Right. Well, if you think about the history of America, Vietnam is really one of the strangest um, times with the 60s and a bunch of other things that seem to all come together at the same time, where you have soldiers fighting in a in a way that, um, or in a war that the general public either didn't know what was going on or was pretty much opposed to. Um, even the Korean conflict, I think, was what they would reflect back upon. But you know, Korea too had more of a purpose, I think, than what Vietnam did. Yeah, in Korea, you still had. Kind of the the vision of World War II fresh in people's minds. By the time Vietnam came around, it was it was a lot more questioning of of authority, you know, on on many fronts. And I think uh, you know, in the Vietnam, and you know, and it was also the tight war where you know you wouldn't have two armies massed up against each other. It was kind of you know a death of a thousand cuts, where you know you didn't know who your enemy was at any one time and. Uh, um, you know, and uh, you know, where they might come from, and, and then they kind of just disappear back into the uh, you know, into the jungle or into the uh, uh, tunnel. Into the yeah, right, right. Well, and the other thing was was that you know I'm not sure that the South Vietnamese government was any better than the North Vietnamese government, so yeah. that also made it much more questionable of who we yeah. were backing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, what are we what are we supporting? What are we trying to uh, preserve there? So, uh, yeah. Well, I've always thought that if Kennedy hadn't been assassinated, well, first of all, I think if Kennedy hadn't been assassinated, we wouldn't have been on the ground in Vietnam for any length of time anyway. Um, he at least learned not to listen to his military advisors. I'm not sure LBJ had that. Yeah, had that insight. Yeah, he had, he did have the Bay of Pigs. Uh, <laughs> he learned his lesson. Yeah. <laughs> so. But then, you know the, Viet- uh, the Civil War, of course, is very interesting to me and Grant in particular because he was, you know, he was one of the probably one of the more uh, he really changed the whole fighting uh, idea. In other words, most of the other generals would back off; he would just he'd keep at it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, of course, why Lincoln loved them. Yeah, but, uh, Lincoln said, "Yeah." I'm not so sure the soldiers all did. <laughs> or you know, or they complain about his alcoholism. He says, "Well, you know, uh, maybe we should give uh, what he's drinking to the other generals." <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I almost fell over the first time I went over to the governor's office, and of course, I saw George McClellan oh, <laughs> up right, on, yeah, the, yes. uh, on the, you know, his portrait up in the governor's office, and I was like, "Oh Lord!" Yeah, <laughs> so we ended up with with uh, what they call a little little something or other. His nickname was. Yeah. Yeah. So that 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 was that, that was kind of funny. So while well, the publishing thing, of course, is is so different today than than, than what it had been, you know. Um, yeah, even back you know back when I self published, you know, uh, Dear Dad, you know, back in 2012. Between then and now, so I think self publishing has gotten a lot. Uh, Better image than than it did back then. Um, uh, I think it's you know uh, 
back then it was just like totally, you know, you couldn't find anybody, so you do it yourself. But now it's, you know, I think you got, do have a lot of people who are kind of going that way because they can kind of control their their own destiny and they can control the, uh, you know, uh, how it works and, and stuff. So, you know, I think, I think push comes to shove, everybody would love to have one of the, you know, one of the big publishers take their book on, but, uh, but it's not quite as, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have quite as much of a stigma, I think, self publishing. No. And the other thing is with the self, uh, the traditional publishers is that not only do they have to, you know, buy your book, but they also have to publicize it and push it. Because otherwise you're still in the same boat as you would be if you self-published. Maybe you don't have, you know, the hoops of getting through the publication process that you have to, you know, jump through on your own. Mm-hmm. But you know the, you know the advertising and all the other parts of that. A lot of them still rely now start relying more so on the author to do. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's you know, and that's kind of uh, you know even with a small you know my my other two books are with. Uh, um, a small traditional publisher. Uh, it's called Black Rose Writings out of Texas, but it's a small independent uh, publisher, um, and they do they do some of the uh, um, you know publicity work for you. But they 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 still rely on the author to to uh, actually do the do the a lot of the legwork. Um, but it's but it's nice having a having someone who at least you don't have to pay for the publication and you get a cover that uh, you know <laughs> that they work out on the uh, yeah you get to approve but it's uh, it's not something you have to shell out uh, you know hundreds of bucks for and then also with their editing process and whatever it kind of yeah. makes that easier yeah. for you you don't have to be hunting around to find an appropriate editor because right. editors too there's a wide range of them oh, and yeah. And, and you need somebody that you can you can work with. Yeah, and work with, and uh, you know, you know, I tried I tried pricing some uh, some editors on my own, and uh, you know, and the good ones, the ones that come, you know, they're, they're it's pretty pretty hefty, and you have to, you know, it is an investment, uh, but you have to kind of say, am I you know, capable to make that investment now? You know, knowing not knowing what the, uh, the return on it is going to be. Exactly, and then and then not even knowing that they're you and them are going to agree over the long term mm-hmm. in terms of what happens with your your novel, right, right? Because everybody's got their own idea, and and if they're the to me, I always say it the English teacher type, if they can become a little bit on the nitpicky side, and not exactly what you, may work for you. My experience, I had many bosses that wanted to edit my stuff at different times. I had some that were great, they'd make it better. And I had other ones that were changing happy to glad and glad to happy. Yeah. And, and that became pointless. You know, right. All of this stuff has got to have a certain comfort level for every one of us. Yeah, and, that, you know, and you know, as the author, I don't want to you know, lose too much of uh, kind of the flavor. And, you know, yeah, I think things can be over-edited. I'm not saying that you know, my uh, my my wife and my sister-in-law they they both worked in fields where you know, my sister-in-law was in uh, journalism and my wife you know worked for uh, for TV where you know conciseness was <laughs> was of the essence. Yes. Uh, you know, writing a novel you kind of you can be a little more expansive and you know and you want to develop things as they go along and you don't need quite the say what you need and you know you can you can say what you need in you know a couple pages as opposed to you know two sentences don't think i could ever be a short story writer i just don't have that uh, you know kind of mindset or you know i mean i, I always find you know true genius is to be you know like a political uh, cartoonist the ones who can Express Absolutely. in one panel, you know, kind of right. just say it all. I'm saying, boy, that is, you know, <laughs> that is really, genius. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, I just don't have a mind like that. I just, you know, my, my preference is, you know, kind of let's let it unfold and, you know, you know, uh, kind of bring people along for the ride. Uh, you know, as they, you know, if that way they kind of get to know, you know, the characters you're writing about and they get to know who you're, uh, the, the story kind of from beginning to end. Yes, and I, I think part of it is to find your own style. When I first started writing, I'd read what I've written and I go, oh, this is 
this really is relatively plain. It certainly is in Melville. <laughs> and and it, it didn't take long for me to figure out. I never want to be Melville. And yeah. I had read I had read all the Bond novels when I was a kid, and there was one I hadn't read, and I read it, and I was going, I'm fine. Yeah. It, uh, my my writing's not farther from the from an Ian Fleming kind of style, so just let it be. It is, there's room in the world for that, that too. There's you know there's, there's lots of uh, lots of styles out there. I think that are uh, you know uh, very uh, appropriate, very uh, you know. Tell tell the tale in an entertaining and uh, in meaningful way, right? And and sometimes, and so, uh, uh, I'm sure that the publishers really have this problem, if they admit it or not, is that they're trying to guess which book is going to make it. And oh, as yeah. we've seen so many times, they misjudge that, and <laughs> the the book that they reject, reject, reject becomes the one that you know becomes the billion dollar seller. Yeah. And oh yeah, yeah. Just ask J.K. Rowling, right? <laughs> Absolutely, and you know, you, you, so you stand there and you go, "It's nobody really has the answer here." No, no, you just kind of hope that you, you know, are in the right place at the right time and reach the right people that uh, you know uh, say, "Oh, this is this is good," and you know, uh, right, and it strikes a chord, and that, and I think that's why one of the most important things as writers that we need to do is write what we want to write. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and hopefully it, it strikes a chord with somebody out there. Um, yes. You know, and, uh, you know, and maybe you know, kind of works its way to be you know commercially successful. But uh, yeah, I, I always tell people that you know I kind of write for myself. If uh, you know, uh, if others like it, that that's gravy, and I and I hope they do. Uh, you know, I, I am the one that has to kind of. You know, live with these characters, and they're the ones. You know, and you know, I kind of, uh, you know, keep them in my mind and everything on, on a daily basis. So, if I'm happy with them and lives they lead, then yeah, you know, then, then I think I've done something. Right, exactly. So now, why don't you tell us about your second novel then? Uh, second novel is uh, it's called Fava. It's uh, Fava is actually the uh, a nickname for the protagonist, uh, Francine Vega, and she's a uh, New York City television reporter who is kind of stuck doing. You know, she wants to do more. She wants to, you know, really do do pieces that uh, that mean something. But she's doing. You know, it opens up with her doing a, a piece on you know a mega lottery that uh, you know uh, biggest uh, jackpot in, in history and she's you know, she's doing it well but then she kind of stumbles on uh, uh, on a story that at first this is just seems kind of uh, far-fetched but as she gets into it and what it is is uh, this one man who had lost uh, his twin brother on 9/11 has the he's going to win the lottery and he's going to use his fortune to Put forward what you know could be the ultimate uh, revenge plot for uh, um, uh, against you know uh, against okay. the fall of Islam. Actually, okay, yeah, because he he gets it in his mind, and uh, you know, and what you know, one thing about my my books is uh, you know I'm not I consider more kind of the genre of suspense, um, you know, in that I don't it's not a real mystery. Because you know, I think people know kind of what, what uh, you know could happen, and in the case of uh, uh, of Fava, is okay. This man, you know, has the wherewithal. And he also has connections too. He, you know, he's a guy who kind of fell off the face of the earth for the past ten years, but now he's going to use those connections to implement this plot to. Uh, um, you know that could really shake Islam to its core, and and could uh, and it falls upon Francine Vega as this reporter who kind of stumbles upon it and kind of uncovers clue after clue of what he's looking to do to get people to convince you know convince people that this is real and that uh, you know it should be stopped and and uh, she you know teams with uh, a uh, an FBI agent eventually, and they kind of work to uh, uh, thwart the plot. Thwart the plot, yeah. So, you know, this one's a lot more. It's more current history, and 
yeah, and this one kind of came. I remember once reading once about you know the five pillars of Islam, and uh, you know it's uh, prayer, fasting, charity, um, belief in uh, uh, you know the one God, and uh, Muhammad is his uh, um, uh, is his messenger, and then the the last pillar is making the Hajj. You know, going taking the, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and uh -huh. other religions. You know, Christianity. Or if you're a Catholic, you want to get to Rome sometime, but it's not really an obligation. Same with Ju you know, Judaism. You, you know, you'd like to go to the Wailing Wall, but you know, there's really no requirement. requirement right. And then, so the guy gets into his mind and said, "Well, what if I were to, you know, make it impossible for people to get to the Hajj?" Would the you know, and in his mind, because of you know, a decade of you know being distraught and everything over the, his twin brother dying, would uh, uh, you know, would Islam fall? And, you know, so uh -huh. yeah, it's it's kind of a uh, it's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a good concept. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been told. Uh, wow, interesting premise, and uh, yeah, I had one review of it saying, "Yeah, where where did you come up with this?" It's, you know, it's kind of a brilliant premise. And I said, "Thank you for the, for the compliment." I didn't think it was all that that brilliant, but it was, uh, you know, it is kind of an interesting uh, concept of, uh, you know, kind of a, a reaction to nine eleven. You know, and, you know, and yeah, you know, the one thing I didn't want to do, and I don't get into you know the nine eleven. You know, uh, uh, tragedy. I didn't want to, you know, play on people's, um, you know, uh, how nine eleven affected us because it affected us all. But I wanted to, kind of, you know, kind of build on that. And say, well, what if we take it to a, you know, a uh, an extreme and, uh, you know, and this type of reaction. And uh, you know, I think, and I think I ended up with a, a pretty good. Uh, you know, suspense thriller that uh, you know takes people on a on a good ride. All right, it's very interesting. It's, it, you know, your protagonist. I mean, there's certainly a reason for him doing what he's doing. That you know is kind of logical. You know, we always, we always had the kind of issue with criminals. It was always trying to figure out why they would do what they would do. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've I've said many times, as many of the homicides, you'll never really understand the why. Yeah. You know, it's just a different mindset. But you know yours, you could certainly understand the why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that to me, any as much as the more you can make things believable, then you have much more leeway where they have to you know suspend disbelief to follow the the story at times. Right. Right. Because sometimes true life is much stranger than fiction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't make up some of the stuff that comes that that somebody will do. Yeah, and it's true. So that sounds that sounds very fascinating. So now, what about your third novel? Then? Uh, third novel is called The Journey of an American Son. Uh, it's also being published by Black Rose Writing, and this is a. Uh, it takes place in uh, the primarily in the 1920s, and it's about a, a young man. He's a you know, brilliant scientist, actually, who is sent by his company. He works for a textiles company and is sent to Calcutta, India, from uh, uh, his home at the time in Boston, uh, to investigate uh, problems that they were having with jute, which is one of the primary, primary uh, um, components of uh, burlap. Okay. And while he's there, he gets involved or takes an interest in the plight of the, the workers there and it's colonial, colonial India and uh, it's a time when you know uh, Gandhi is just starting to uh, to rise in international fame and, and prominence and he gets a little too close to um, a uh, there was an accident at the mill before he got there and kind of starts asking too many questions and the powers that be frame him for another murder of a different, you know, an Indian national and he's sent away to, you know, to jail for uh, 20 years of hard labor. 
And the book is about his wife's efforts. You know, it was 8,000 miles away in 1920 trying to, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, prove his innocence and, uh, and free him. Um, now, you know, the one thing, you know, people might, you know, you were talking about, uh, got to be believable, you know, taking a trip to Calcutta in 1920. The thing is that uh, the inspiration for this was based on a diary, a journal, I had found that my grandfather had written of such a trip that he made going from Boston to Calcutta. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and for the most part, the, you know, his, his journal is rather dry and, you know, he was kind of a you know, puritanical uh, New Englander. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it did have you know, some nuggets in there, you know, like one, one point where he's on board ship and all of a sudden, uh, these ambulances show up and they start unloading this uh, like 15 lepers to go on this ship and they're taking what he asked one of the stewards says what's going on he says oh we're taking them to a leper colony <laughs> oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. oh wow <laughs> so it things like that and, you know and you know and on the ship from uh, you know you can imagine getting from Boston to Calcutta at that time you know is not a simple matter of just jumping on a plane, you know, you have to take a train across Canada and then a, a steamer from Vancouver to, to Tokyo. And then a, another steamer from Tokyo down around Southeast Asia, you know, into Calcutta, you know, oh. yeah. And, uh, you know, so he, he experienced, you know, he, he uh, uh, kind of encountered, you know, geisha girls and, uh, on his ship from Vancouver, there was a, uh, silent film starlet of the time. And, you know, so there's an occasional nugget in here, but overall it just kind of provides a framework for, you know, for the, for the plot. And then, you know, I used kind of various, you know, I used not, my grandfather was, uh, you know, a character, but then I used, you know, my wife's family um, who, you know, emigrated from, uh, you know, Eastern Europe in the, you know, late 1890s. I kind of used, you know, her, her grandparents and, you know, some family friends is kind of the models for my character. So, you know, uh -huh. this, this one was a lot of fun because I was able to kind of weave in kind of people I knew and stories of that I knew and, you know, and then, you know, to try and build up a plot that, uh, you know, was not just a, you know, a trip, but actually, you know, was a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, you know, some, something that, that was overarching, you know, and, you know, by the way, I'm trying to, you know, the issues like, you know, racism and anti-Semitism and women's rights and nationalism and, you know, all kind of weaving in and out of the, out of the book. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, even though that is, you know, less than a hundred years ago, the world has changed yeah. so much. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I never would have thought that they would have gone the the route, you know, from the Pacific. In my mind, I was thinking you'd go the across the Atlantic, but I guess you'd have to go around that what is it, the Cape of Good Horn or something down there in Africa, which is really a nasty uh, sea voyage. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly why he went that way. You know, my grandfather. In the book, I, I presented that the reason was that, that they had customers along the way in Tokyo and in, you know, Hong Kong. And, you know, so his traveling companions would be doing business along the way, you know, as they, right. as they made their way, you know, through there. But it's kind of unclear in his journal as to, okay, so why did they choose that? Why not go, you know, through the, you know, Suez Canal? And, uh, you know, I think actually he came back that way. But uh, didn't go that way. So. Yeah. Well, it is. It's just fascinating because you know the historical parts of it. You know, you seem to have really you know pegged them very well. Yeah. No. You know, it's uh, you know the diary. You know, helped to kind of enhance the realism of it. You know, I've done done a fair amount of reading, and uh, you know, you know another thing that I you know kind of I always like to to learn something as I'm, as I'm writing these, you know, and father was, you know, kind of, you know, I really didn't know a lot about Islam. So it was, you know, it was, you know, good for me to kind of do some reading on it and actually, you know, you know, learn about this, you know, religion that, you know, we kind of, you know, in many ways kind of castigate and hold it, you know, being for the fault of the world. And, you know, uh, um, 
you know, and in this book, you know, like things like World War One, you know, the the main character, uh, you know, is a is a war hero during during the during the war, and I didn't really know all that much about that that particular war. Just kind of, you know, it was the war in all wars, and you know, we all know how that war worked out. So. Uh, <laughs> Basically, guys stuck in trenches shooting at one another. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the, the, the main image that uh, you know, everyone has of it. Uh, um, unless you were in the Air Force, then then you had fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you, you know, with the planes developed, you could be an ace, uh-huh. and get shot down, or whatever. That 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 part of it always fascinated me. But I was thinking not too long ago. Oh my God, how cold it had to be up there! Because mm-hmm. as you go up and. <laughs> In height, the temperatures drop quickly. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and to be fighting in the winter, you know, in an airplane that has Open, it's un- in, not enclosed, yeah, yeah, you know, you'd be numb. But uh, no, that's very fascinating, and, and you seem to have such a wide range of topics. Yeah, yeah, I think you know, and uh, you know, actually, the book I'm working on now is a uh, is a sequel to Fava. Um, you know, and it, it was really kind of unintentional, but, uh, you know, kind of, once you read it, kind of said, well, this, this is really set up for a, <laughs> for a sequel, but it was, it was totally unintentional. It was just kind of, oh, yeah, there, you know, there are some things I can build on for a, you know, for a new book here. So, uh, yeah, and I did really love the, the main character, you know, of Fav, and I just thought, uh, yeah, she's, she's a good one to kind of build on. And, uh, you know, I, I have been complimented by, uh, you know, my, my sister-in-law and others who say, you know, you, you do very, very good women character. You're very, very, you know, you're very strong women characters, and I took that as ultimate compliment coming from them. So yes. <laughs> well, and then you start learning your strengths, and and I think each time we write, we do get better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. You know, because you start learning better technique, yeah, and and you're building on what you, what you've done before, and uh, you know, kind of, you know, and also, you know, hopefully you've learned from, you know, what you. Did wrong, but that doesn't always <laughs> work out, does it? No. Well, and sometimes, sometimes it's just the way you're going to write, so you can't drive yourself crazy on that either. Yeah. You know, I always tell people, just put it down on paper. It, if it's not on paper, you can't, you can't edit it. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's the best advice that I would have for you know, uh, you know, uh, for anybody who wants to write is you know, just just start writing, just start putting it down and, you know, you can go back, you can, you know, throw out what you didn't like and you can, you know, edit away and, you know, but if you don't do that, then it's just going to be totally, uh, fall on your head. Oh yeah. And just totally intimidating. You just kind of keep yeah. telling yourself, oh, I can't do this. I can't, uh, you know, I, I can never write a novel. You know, well, you know, I kind of used to think that too, it was something I wanted to do, but it was, it was intimidating the the idea of actually doing it, but then once I started writing, you know, and uh, you know, and I think the other advice for you know any any writer is you know, kind of you know don't let the bastards get you down, you know you got to because you know you know it's in the end it's worth it just you know knowing that that you did it you know uh, there's some nights I'm going to go to bed and I've said you know I'm really proud of myself for <laughs> you know. Or, you know, writing, uh, writing these novels and, you know, kind of creating these worlds and, um, you know. It is a major accomplishment. Well, John, we're almost out of time. Can uh, you give some information on how people could contact you? Well, the, you know, every, uh, I think probably the best, best place is uh, to go to my website, um, which is still a work in progress, but it has all the contact information. It's... Uh, um, John W. Hazen, H A Z, you know, uh, John with an H, W Hazen, H A Z E N, uh, one word, uh, dot com. And uh, I have uh, you know, my Twitter is uh, at uh, John underscore Hazen. Um, and I think between those those two pieces of information that uh, you know people would be able to get in touch with me and uh, uh, you know my books can all be found on on Amazon if you just you know, type in the titles and uh, you know and uh, Hazen you know they have a way of coming up so uh, you know I, I do thank you again and you know it's nice, nice meeting you in, in person we have you know a bunch of emails back and forth and it's you know uh, it's been, yeah. been, been very uh, nice talking with you and I you know I do appreciate the opportunity 
Okay, just hold on a second. I'll be back with you. For those listening, I want to say thanks to Our-Truth.com for broadcasting this show. You can find more information about me and my book series, The Archangel Jeremiel and the War to Conquer Heaven, at www.john-j-higgins.com. And the website for this radio show is www.hangingwithhiggins.com. And with that, I will say good night. <laughs>